Father, we prayed this morning as we sang that hymn, How Great Thou Art, uh, that we would reflect upon what you have revealed to us in history, that you are great, and that your greatness is all around us all the time to every person on earth. So we pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes to your greatness as you've shown it down through the corridors of time. For we ask this in our Savior's name, amen. I might start by just introducing a way I have of looking at the Bible that I found useful. This is not a substitute for verse-by-verse -verse teaching. It's not a substitute for reading through our Bibles each year, but it is a way of using the content of Scripture. Uh, when I was in um, college, and I was part of a small group of uh, guys who became Christians all in our freshman year. And we were in a pretty academically hostile environment to the Christian faith. And one of the um, things that one of the Christian professors told us one time, it's like you have these moments when somebody really tells you something that lasts. And he said, you men, are going to experience every assault on the Christian faith for your next four years. You better be prepared to handle that. And you've got to be able to think through the Bible quickly because these attacks come from all directions. And you've got to be able to think through the basics of Scripture. So over the years, I've tried to help college students by just concentrating on certain events this, again, this is not substitute for verse-by-verse -verse teaching, but if you think of creation, you think of the fall, and so on, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, so that's, that's what I call when I use the word framework. Um, the second time uh, I, I had a professor tell me something that uh, has stayed with me the rest of my life, uh, there was a, a biblical archeologist at um, Johns Hopkins many years ago at the turn of the century. And he had written a book, and we were discussing the book in, in, our, in our training, and it was called The Old Testament Against Its Environment. The Old Testament Against Its Environment. And the point of the book was that when we read the scriptures, we're reading the scriptures in a fallen world. And those scriptures have been assaulted from the very first day uh, they were recorded. And what we need to do, and it sharpens your understanding of, of what we're reading when we read the text of scripture. If you'll think about how this particular passage is opposed by the culture around us. Because when you think of something that's, this is true, this is false, it sharpens your ability to see what is true. And so I hope that what we'll do to, um, this morning will start to show that uh, in, in the early chapters of Genesis. Let's see, let me get it back here. This is a timeline uh, of the events. This is what I'm talking about, being able to think through the basic events. We start out with the creation, the fall, the flood, uh, the Tower of Babel, Abraham, and it's, it's visualizing these were real events. This is not a poetry, this is not um, a, a proverb, this is a re record of actual events. And here's the advantage it gives you. Every one of these events is a step forward in time, as you go from the right side to the left side of that diagram, it's the progress of God's revelation. So God has given that revelation sequentially. And we'll see why God is so wise in how he does this. God is the perfect teacher. He doesn't overload at one point. He gives us increments and pieces. But the other thing is, it's not just chronology. It's not just a time sequence of events. It's something else. And that is that each event in that sequence is a step to understand the next one. So if we start, we have to start with creation. That sets up 
certain things that we'll talk about this morning. And those things it sets up, those truths it sets up, undergird the whole rest of the Bible. So every other event builds on that event. Then after creation, we have the fall, the introduction of evil, sorrow, and death, and obviously the need for redemption. So that lasts throughout the whole school. That's the basis of why Jesus Christ had to come. So we have the creation, then on top of that we have the fall. So now we understand the universe is God's handiwork disrupted by sin. And then we come to Abraham and, and the program through Israel and so forth. So another way of thinking of this, and I found this helpful too, is that we all have our imaginations. So when we read something, we can use our imagination and think about it. So each of these events, if we look at the event itself, like the creation, the fall, and the flood, visualize what you would have thought were you there when this event happened. And it's an exercise, but we have the imagination, we have the tools available so we can project ourselves by our imagination into that event. And then when we do that, we see the great truths revealed in that event. We can visualize what would it have been if we were there five minutes after Adam and Eve were created. We would walk through the Garden of Eden. We would have a question, how old was Adam and Eve, when they would probably look about 30 but they were only five minutes old. So it would be a strange place for us to be there at moments after the creation. But it would, it would be an environment that like nothing we've seen because it was pre-fall. And so sequentially thinking of this, it's, a, it's just a roadmap through the scriptures and to be able to think of these things uh, in that sense. Now, what we want to do now is we want to, let's see, what did I do here? Yeah, there it is. We want to take the first two verses. Now, right away, we're in big, big opposition. We have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the total universe. God created the entire universe. This is very important, as we'll see before we finish today. The earth was without form uh, and void. It means it was uninhabited. It was the mass of the total, total universe, actually. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So now we have a little bit of of understanding the Trinity is slightly available here. Here, God is creating, his spirit is working. And there, this is the setup for what is going to become um, very clear in the New Testament. Now, we say that biblical events are always challenged by the envi cultural environment. So what we want to think about is why is it that up until the late 1700s, there wasn't one Roman Catholic theologian, there wasn't one Protestant theologian, there was not one Anabaptist theologian that believed in an old earth? All of them accepted a young earth that history has not gone on for millions of years. History is short far shorter than we've, we've been taught in our school. It was this verse early on, about the late 1700s, that people began to say, you know, the earth is old, we have the, the geolo geological strata and so on, and where is that in the Bible? And so there were two men in particular that made a big change in the way, particularly Western civilization thought. One was James Hutton in 1785, and I noticed the dates, just notice the date, 1785. 
Hutton said in a book called The Theory of the Earth, he was a deist. He had no need, he said, to reconcile with scripture. So he's thinking up what is the long age of the earth, but he's not trying to match it with the scriptures. Then uh, we have a man in 1830, between the years of 1830 and 1833, Charles Lyell. And here's what Lyell is doing. He is also a deist. Neither of these men are Christians. Deists did not believe that God verbally revealed himself in history. So here are some quotes, and I tried to pick these quotes out because they show you what he's thinking. He says, old, he's talking here about a journal, and he did a very clever thing. It's still being done today between science and politics. He organized a journal a scientific organization, and he was able to dominate the culture of his time. And so old Fleming, this was a man who was involved in one of these journals, who was involved with Christian clergy. And he says, old Fleming is frightened and thinks the age will not stay in my anti-Mosaic conclusions. And this is his advice to him. He's advising this man who has connections within the uh, ministries, he says, if you don't triumph over them, but compliment the libera liberality and candor of the present age, and the bishops and enlightened saints will join us. Notice the last sentence. They will join us if we treat them nicely. And then his declaration about the rise of historical geology. These men were all amateur um, geologists. Geology wasn't a science back then, so they were men who were the first guys to start looking at strata. He says, the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if scripture were not in existence. So what happened here? The, Lyell wasn't alone. There were other men equally capable, equally acquainted with a, with a strata in the field, and they were flood geologists. In other words, they looked at the strata and said, this is not strata that formed over millions of years. This is strata that is, first of all, deposited by water, and it was deposited rapidly. But the problem was Lyell outsmarted them, and this is a lesson we Christians need to think about. Lyell started a group. The flood geologists were all independents. There were a guy here and a guy here and a guy here. They did not have the capability of writing a journal. Lyell was a lawyer and he had a lot of money, so he was able to finance the journal. The lesson we learn right here between the scriptures and the culture against it is we need to work together. The flood geologists did not work together. Now, they had evidence. One of the key evidences that the flood geologists kept pointing to and Lyell totally ignored was things like this. How do you explain this as a slow process of millions of years? There's a tree trunk in this strata. Did it sit there for a million years while the rock slowly built up around it? Obviously not that the tree trunk there was rapidly buried by various strata. And the flood geologist said, this is a sign not of slow erosion and sedimentation, this is a sign of rapid deposition. And of course we know now, we've had a lot more uh, ex experience with this. Um, we had at least two events in our recent time of rapid geological events happening. If, if, if we take the idea of work divided by time, uh, that's power in physics class. So if work is done quickly, it's a high power event. If the same work is done slowly, it's a low power event. And the whole idea of Lyell was the earth 
is to be explained as he had a doctrine called uniformitarianism where the processes we observe today are the same process that went on for millions of years and the processes are the same rate. So for example, erosion today is slow, except in times of a tsunami or something. And so he said, it's always been slow. And you can understand why this is attractive to do this. Well, um, the, the, the lesson besides the fact that the flood geologists didn't get together as Christians and think through and, and help each other work through this, uh, it was a disaster, and it wasn't until later in time, which I'll show you in a moment here, uh, that we, we uh, actually had a situation where creationists got together, and I'll show you more about that in a moment. This is a diagram I've shown here before. Don't worry about all the details on it, but the idea behind this diagram is the x-axis is um, time and the vertical axis is distance. And the idea of that square in the middle is our lifetime is the limit on what we can see and what we can um, experience. So the gray area is our own personal information, our own personal experience. And it's capped, obviously, between the time we are born to the time we die. The, we can extend our understanding of the universe. We can extend it in distance, telescope. It's a tool to see in distance. We can extend our eyesight down into the smaller and smaller things with a microscope. We can extend our knowledge of fast events by high-speed photography. Over at Aberdeen Proving Ground, when I worked there, they have high-speed cameras that are looking at a, at a shell going through tank armor and it happens so fast, they've got to take millions of frames of, of pictures to see how do we design a round that will penetrate the enemy's armor. And you can't do that if you can't see what's happening. So we can do that, but you'll notice there's a problem. There's nothing going to the right. And the reason is, is because if you go to the right, that's time that we can experience. It's the future, but it's also the past. The future and the past. The future is we can predict it, try to predict it, but it's not experienced. We don't have a personal experience of the future because it hasn't happened yet. But also, we don't have personal experience, observations, or measurements of the past if there was no one there to do the measuring. So I'm going to ask um, Josh if you'll take the cord there, and Brooks, if you can get it. What I'm asking these two, I've got a fish line here going from one side of the auditorium to the other, and that distance, uh, our pastor pasted off, it's 81 feet, it's 972 inches, that, that fish line. Now if that fish line represents 2.9 million years, of the human existence on the planet, the amount of measurements we have is only two inches. So now, how confident can we be about past history if we only have observations and measurements for two inches out of 81 feet? And if we say, okay, let's think about if the universe is four billion years old, then, how many observations and measurements do we have on this string that would correspond to it? One one thousandth of an inch. So I hope this kind of shows you how much is speculation and how much is actually measured science. Okay, guys, thank you. The, uh, the point here is that there are two kinds of science. And there's a bait and switch that's been going on for about 200 years. We're all impressed with the accomplishments of science. Send a person to the moon, we do all sorts of research in the genome. And so we, we know and respect scientific research. 
And that's correct. That's one of the God's gifts to the human race, part of the naming. However, when you discuss what goes to the right of that diagram, you're talking about the future or you're talking about the past that is not measured, you have no observations, that's different, that's a forensic issue. And so we call that historical science. But what happens in our educational system is we talk science, 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 and then there's a bait and switch that happens. We talk about measured science, we do experiments, and so on and so on. Then we suddenly we start talking about the ancient past, millions of years with no measurements or anything else. That's not measured science. So there's two kinds of science here. There's operational, everyday laboratory science that we all are acquainted with. And then there's historical science, which is, has to be, conjecture. So that's the problem with uniformitarianism and Lyell. They postulated uniformitarianism that the same process at the same rates are going on. But thankfully, the Lord's work so that we have two great illustrations among many thousands. In fact, was it two, two days ago we had that big explosion that was captured on the satellites in the South, uh, South Pacific? 1979, there was a violent explosion at Mount St. Helens in Washington State. When that volcano exploded, thankfully, they knew that it was going to do something, so they positioned video cameras. So now we've got a violent event that was filmed. So now we've got measurements and we've got video and so on. The debris that came off that mountain was a, a mix of chaotic rocks, dirt, and water. The, the professionals call it a slurry mix. Mathematics of a slurry mix are still being investigated because we don't understand what happened. Came down up to eight, 90 miles an hour, sliding down in total chaos on the side of Mount St. Helens. But here's the amazing thing. It all settled out, and there's a mini Grand Canyon that was formed, hardened up over two or three years, and you take a photograph of that thing and you swear you're looking at the Grand Canyon. It's all nice and organized, all level. How the heck did a slurry mix coming down at 90 miles an hour chaotically all of a sudden get perfectly stratified? Looking like it just settled there very gently. It's not known. A fellow that's investigating it told me he's trying to raise $30,000 to talk to a fluid dynamicist to figure out how, what was going on in that thing. So that's one illustration of a non-uniformitarian explosion that happened, a high power event that was videoed and was measured. The second one is, I'm going to cite is the Japanese tsunami. Remember the one that you saw pictures of with that water just sweeping across cars, sweeping across buildings, wrecked one of the nuclear power plants in Japan? Well, that particular event what caused it? Thankfully, uh, the geologists that are doing measuring work know about what's called tectonic plates. These are on top of the Earth's mantle, and they undergird our continents. And what happened was one of the plates in the Pacific Ocean is trying to slide west, and the, the, the plate underneath the whole Japanese archipelago is trying to slide east. And instead of slipping, they every once in a they get caught and they got tangled and then they suddenly let go. In 15 minutes, the islands of Japan moved eight feet. That was when the tectonic plate underneath slipped. And today, the creation flood, the creation flood geologists are saying that's probably one of the mechanisms God used in the great flood. So there we have a non-uniformitarian event. So the point here is, did Lyell ever see one of these? Apparently not, or he wouldn't have come up with a doctrine of uniformitarianism. So, what, so the, po the point we're trying to say is that we have no measurements. Well, I know some of you are gonna think about, well, yes, we do have measurements, don't we? Don't we have radioactive decay? Well, I brought a little demonstration here. I tried this, this is for the, 
people concerned about fire, this is an electrical simulation of a candle. Um, I waited until my oldest granddaughter got first year algebra so she could understand the, the, what's going on here. I asked her, I said, look, go to your bedroom. I'm going to be out here in the dining room and we're going to light a candle. And I'm not going to tell you when I lighted it. You're going to stay in your room 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll call you out. And what I want you to do is figure out how long was, how tall was this candle when it was first ignited? And secondly, how long has it been burning? And you, you can figure this out. There's a candle. And there's the, what you have to figure. You have the starting length. You've got to know what the starting length is. You've got to know what the burn rate is. You've got to know the burn duration and to get the, the measure uh, what it is now. Well, you, you, we know what, what it is now, so that's why it's black. We know the time uh, in this case, so that's black. But we have two unknowns. We do not know the starting length of the candle nor do we know the rate of burn. Because I told her, well, you can just measure the rate of burn. I said, how do you know I didn't blow a fan on this? The rate of burn is not necessarily constant. The only way you can solve that is you've got to speculate on what the initial condition was, and you have to guess what the rate was. And that's the thing that plagues all radioactive measurements. For example, People went to the moon, brought back samples from the moon's surface, and dated by different methods. One method yielded two million years for the dust from the moon. The other measurement was two billion years for the dust of the moon. So now we've got two different ways of measuring, but the measurements don't coalesce. Then we have the case in Mount St. Helens. When they measured the debris by radioactive dating, it came out 2.8 billion years. Well, it wasn't 2.8 billion years, it was 1979. So the problem here is the math that goes into radioactive dating is very similar to what we just did here. This is very simplified, but it's the same math. So I'm, I'm showing you all this is because we've all been snookered into thinking that when people say very confidently, like Sagan said in his famous TV series, A Cosmos, is that we know the universe is four or five billion years old. Well, we know we don't. We don't know it by the same kind of science because we weren't there and we didn't have any photography and we didn't have any measurements. So let's get a little more humble. So now what I want to show you, and this is part of the insert in the bulletin, is Christians developed a strategy here, and we want to learn a lesson. Remember I kept saying the flood geologists didn't stick together, they didn't help one another, and they lost the battle. The first time of, of um, when, when historical geology started, early on, you see the date there, about uh, since the 1800s, it would be that between 1700 and 1800, that's when higher criticism of the Bible started. And basically what they did is they completely threw out the authenticity of the scriptures. Now, we have to, wait a minute, just wait a minute here. What is the Bible? You know, we said it over and over. The Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library of literature. And it's unique literature. In all, the, in all the world, you will not find a library like the Bible. The Bible was written by 40 different people, 66 different uh, literary creations of these 40 people. They wrote in three different languages over 1,500 years. Show me a library of that many people written by that long a time with internal consistency, detailing prophecies, like predicting when Messiah would be born and where he would be born. What library do you know that has that, those qualities? So anyway, the point was higher critics, usually in Germany, 
where they elevated science above the Bible. That's why the lady that built this little diagram, she put the green science on top of the black Bible. That was one way. I call that the surrender strategy. That's where we completely surrendered the, the authenticity and applications of scripture. Then along came about 1800, we had people saying, well, maybe we can pack the age of the Bible inside Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Well, the problem that we have with that is that you, you are saying that all the geology is explained between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Well, what do you do with the flood? If you pack all the, the, the stuff there back in Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, you've got nothing for Genesis 6, 7, and 8. So Genesis 6, 7, and 8 is un, uh, very clearly uh, that it is, um, it, it's one flood there. So the accommodation strategy, uh, this involved the putting the ages inside Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, or sometimes saying that instead of seven days, it was seven ages, the day age approach. These were all approaches done in, in, in um, between 1804 and 1823. Remember the dates of Lyell? That was exactly the time that he was going on. So here, Christians and even conservatives said we have to accommodate the Bible to historical geology. And the, my contention is they misunderstood what historical geology is telling them. Finally, it wasn't until 1960 when two men, one a theologian who taught Old Testament at Grace Seminary, and one a hydrodynamicist, scientist, Henry Morris, took 10 years to challenge these whole strategies. The book that they did, I brought these two in so you can see them. Uh, this is the book, The Genesis Flood. This was such a bombshell of a book in 1960 that no dispensational conservative publisher would dare publish it. Interestingly, it was a post-millennial covenant theologian by the name of Rusas Rushduni who said, when he read the manuscript, he said, this, is, this has got to be published. And so he called up Sam Craig, who owned Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company up there in Philadelphia, said, Sam, publish the book. And that's why to this day, when you open it up, you'll see the copyright is with Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company, and that usually, they're not the ones that are super conservative. So anyway, that's the Genesis flood. And Thankfully, that launched a creationist movement. That was in 1960. We're 2022. So 1960, that's 40 years to 2022. It's so 62 years we've had time for creationist scientists to get together and help one another and do good science work. And the funny thing is, that it's been Christian guys who are conservative, and gals, who are conservative and they believe the Bible and they're saying the Bible is going to give me uh, the way of looking at God's creation. So here's a quote. Uh, here's why, by the way, the accommodation strategy fails. If it's a global judgment in one, two, then the Noahic flood must have been local. Geological strata are similar all over the world, showing that it's a one coherent record. Second Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 are all talking about the Noahic flood. Not two floods, one flood. Henry Morris, the author of that book that I just showed, um, I knew him because I wrote my thesis on this book and the response it had. Uh, so I got to know him quite, a, quite well. Uh, it has long um, seemed, uh, let me see if I can read this. It has long seemed um, anomalous to me as a professional scientist and non-professional Bible reader 
that the modern revival of biblical, literal creationism has been led mostly by scientists rather than theologians. It is true there are many good scientific evidences pointing to special creation of young earth and the global flood. But the compelling and definitive evidences are biblical, not scientific. Science and the scientific method support creation, but can never prove absolutely creation or disprove absolutely evolution. Nor can it determine the age of the earth or prove there was a worldwide deluge in the sense of a, a perfectly tight proof. But the Bible is explicitly clear in these issues. There is not even a hint of evolution or the long ages implied by evolution in the Bible. Neither is there any biblical intimation that Genesis flood is local. One does not have to be a theologian or a Bible scholar to see this. It is quite evident to anyone who simply reads the Bible and believes it to be the errant, inerrant word of God. Well, as a result of that, there's been some tremendous developments in creation science. One of the fundamental was, this is probably the most expensive financed uh, apologetics research project that was done in the history of the Christian church. It's the radioactive age of the earth. And there's all kinds of stuff in here that um, are just valuable things. But I just show this, this is a sample. It, work is continuing, they've done work. Mostly, this was in geology and, and radioactive dating. But they've also now done work on the genome. You've heard it said that our genome is, is uh, chimpanzees are, have a genome very close to us, like it's 95 percent. Well, it's true, they have arms and they look a little bit like us. Um, but um, after they checked the facts and began to go down and do a map of the genome, that's not true. It's only like 80 percent like man. But you see, what happens is we're so taken up with science is autonomous, we don't need the scriptures and so forth and so on. We don't even look at what's going on. Example, medicine. Think about what happened maybe, well, when I was growing up in the, in the 40s, um, the fear we all had when we went to school to see the iron lungs with kids sitting inside an iron lung because of polio. Well, that was the same generation that doctors said, oh, take out the tonsils. And guess what? After the vaccine comes out, oh, the tonsils are the place where the antibodies for polio were growing. Uh, well, so, here, think about what goes, the same thing with the pen, appendix. The organs on our body, like tonsils and appendix, are looked on, if you're an evolutionist, as just vestigial organs. They've just been there, accumulated. Our bodies have all kinds of stuff of the four or five million years of random evolution. But if we're creationists, we can't accept that view of the human body. The human body is an engineered system. It's got engineering fine points to it. And this, the appendix is part of our immune system. It's not a vestigial organ. Tonsils are not vestigial organs. They're part of their immune system. So we discover that later in spite of the wrong kind of thinking. But medically, if you think of the human body as just accumulated random events happened by chance, then you're going to have one view of medicine. If you believe as a Christian that God created man as a special creation, then you are going to have a totally different view of, of, of the Bible. Now, we go to the rest of Genesis, and we can go quickly through the... Um, let's see. Six days from Genesis 1-3 to Genesis 1-31 have a pattern to them. And if you'll notice the pattern is, is God says, let there uh, be a separation and so on, the domain of light and darkness. And then he fills it on day four with inhabitants or, or pieces of creation. Then he has the oceans form 
and then he populates the ocean and the atmosphere with fish and birds. And then the last one, land he creates, land, and then we have animals and man. So there's a pattern to how God created, and it was literal days. How do we know it's literal days? Because what does Exodus say? In how many days do we work? Six, and we rest on the seventh. Is it, have you ever asked the question of how come every civilization and every nation has a seven-day week? It was communists under Stalin that said, we want to get rid of, of the silly idea of one in six resting. What we want to do is have one in 10. And they tried a 10-day week under communism. It didn't work. People were fatigued, all kinds of things. We're not made to live that way. God told us how to live. Six days and one day. Our, Carol and I just uh, were as amused when we were raising our kids. We had one son that we really believed that you rest six days and work one. <laughs> but, but turns out he, he's a professional now, um, working hard. So anyhow, there was no, got the end, the last verse 31 in this pa Genesis passage, what does God say? He saw everything he had made and it was very good. You know what that means? No death, no sorrow, no suffering. When it left, and this is, we'll get into this in, in the second time or third time we talk, is that when God finished his work, his craftsmanship, and it left his hands, so he took his hands off, he said, this is very good. I think the reason why we have communism and some of the Marxists, we have fascism, we have the Roman Empire, we have the Tower of Babel, I think even in our sin, humanity, I don't know whether you can say we remember Eden, but we have a passion that this world is not what it should be, and we want to improve it. There's a, a utopian thrust to, to folks. And when it's not disciplined by the scriptures, we resort to human work. Basically, it's human works on a global scale. Well, now uh, we have the diagram in the bulletin of the implications. We want to go to the implications. We won't bother with the right side of this chart because we'll cover that uh, later on. But on the left side, if we go through it, I want to just touch on a few things. In the top part of the chart, we have, uh, shall I bow to my creator? We have ancient monotheism, ancient Israel, the Bible, and fundamentalism. Now, that's a history. That is a sequence of history of people that accept the Bible. And the first one is ancient monotheism. Now, for a long time, People believed that it, monotheism evolved from polytheism. And so it was just a slow process. However, some Roman Catholic conservatives did work in the 1920s. This is one of them. I brought it in, Origin and Growth of Religion by Wilhelm Schmidt. He concluded, you can see the, the distance here, this is research that they did on what they called primitive cultures. But they, they're, they're not primitive cultures, they're isolated cultures. And he deliberately wanted to go to isolated cultures so that he could see what would have happened before we mix with modern civilization. So the idea was, let's look at these isolated cultures to see what Early in history, these people knew religiously. Well, the, it's amazing what they discovered. He says, North American primitives. So some of these people don't even exist anymore because of civilization is mixed with them. Here's what he found. Here we find the supreme being moving on an astonishingly high plane. He appears among the three groups of primitives whose culture is related to the Arctic regions for all of whom we have data in many ways remarkably good. In particular, the idea of creative activity is in force here in its highest form, amounting even to definite creation from nothing. Now, where did that idea? These people have not lost everything. 
that, were, that we possessed after the flood. And all that people had back then was the Noahic Bible. But it shows you people that do the work, people that do the research, and are open to these things, discover things. And of course, biblically, we know what happened before, as ancient Israel, that would be a call of Abraham, the first Jew. Who did Abraham get blessed by? He broke the Hebrews. Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a Gentile monotheist, and he was handing the baton to Abraham. So monotheism lasted after the flood for centuries. And then we have Israel in the Bible. Then we come to the last name there in that list, fundamentalism. Now, I know you probably think of it as kind of a bad thing because of the publicity, but I want to clue you in to what real fundamentalists were. These were men you and I can thank for the existence of this church bill. We wouldn't be here had these people, men and women, took in a hard line that we accept the authority of scripture in the era of World War I. Higher criticism had swept the world, had swept many denominations, and there was a fight going on. Here's a quote. Here's Kearsop Lake, a English New Testament scholar. Kearsop Lake was a liberal. Kearsop Lake did not accept the full authority of scripture, but here's what he warns his scholars. He says, it is a mistake often made by educated persons who happen to have but little knowledge of historical theology to suppose that fundamentalism is a new and strange form of thought. Uh, look down at the date, 1926. So in your mind, think about this is post-World War I and the fundamentalist modernist debate is on. It is nothing of the kind. Fundamentalism is the partial and uneducated survival of a theology, look at this language, which was once universally held by the church. The fundamentalist may be wrong, I think he is, but it is we who have departed from the tradition and he, and I'm, and I'm sorry for anyone who tries to argue with the fundamentalists on the basis of authority. And then his last sentence, the Bible and the corpus theologicum of the church is on the fundamentalist side. So here's an honest liberal scholar saying we have departed. Of course, he has a little jab in there about the uneducated survival. <laughs> well, here are four books. These are four volumes called the fundamentals. They were published in the er, right around this time, 1920 or so. And if you spin through these, you realize these men are not uneducated. The man who writes the Old Testament section and defends the, funda the authority of the Old Testament scriptures was Robert Dick Wilson. Robert Dick Wilson, when he was a young man, said, I'm going to divide my life as an adult into three 15-year segments. In the first 15 years, I am going to learn every single ancient Near Eastern language that the liberals are using to critique the Bible. My second 15 years, I'm going to go and I'm going to check every one of the sources that now exist of all of those ancient languages. There's something like 26 languages he became fluent in. And I tried, you know, I'm fluent in one. Um, so here he is reading these ancient literature. He's, he's going into the source material of the liberal attacks on the Bible. And then in the last 15 years of his life, he wrote things like these. So it was, wasn't uneducated survival, but I do want to show you that last sentence. The Bible and the corpus theologicum of the church is on the fundamentalist side. We have not divided the church. They have divided the church. One more passage. Here is a 1924. Notice the dates. Christianity according to fundamentalism is one religion. Christianity according to modernism is another religion. Which is the true religion is the question that is to be settled in all probability by our generation for future generations. The God of the fundamentalist is one God. The God of the modernists is another. The Christ of the fundamentalist is one Christ. The Christ of the modernists is another. 
The Bible, the church, the kingdom, the salvation, the consummation of all things, these are one thing to fundamentalists and another thing to modernists. And so this split, every major denomination, every major denomination split over this issue, except maybe the Southern Baptists. So the Presbyterian Church went through an awful time splitting, throwing out J. Gresham Machen, the scholar of the New Testament, who was in charge of the Presbyterian Mission Board, was fired, defrocked, and thrown out of the Presbyterian because he wrote one book called Christianity and Liberalism. Obviously, by the title, you can tell where he was. So these are the uneducated people that were called fundamentalists. So just keep that in mind when you hear some derogatory term about the fundamentalists. Now, finally, we want to deal with just a few of impl more implications here. The next thing down is the creator-creature distinction. If we don't get anything uh, out of this this morning except this, you've got the, the key. With Genesis 1-1, you have two existences. You have the eternal existence of the creator, and you have the limited existence of creatures. We are not creators, we are creatures. And that means like the hymn we sang, um, mighty, the, the idea of a God of wonders. Um, in, in that song that we sang, you remember the, sto the theme about I hear the rolling thunder and, and so on. So it's a case where we, we are around his handiwork. So God is sovereign, God is the controller, God sets the pace. Now, sometimes later on, uh, as modernists try to defect and keep their ethics, I thought it was fascinating when I read Nietzsche. Nietzsche was an outstanding atheist in the 1800s. The, the modern men that are writing these little atheist books now are just angry men that have a gripe with God, but they're not thinking through anything original. But people like Nietzsche did. And here's his response to, Christian, to a culture that tried to keep Christian morality after they denied the Christian faith. Devastating critique he has here. When one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. Christianity is a system a whole view of things thought and out together. By breaking one main concept out of it, the faith in God, one breaks the whole. Nothing necessary remains in one's hands. Christianity presupposes that man does not know, cannot know what is good for him, what is evil. He believes in God who alone knows it. Christian morality is a command. Its origin is transcendent. It is beyond all criticism. It has truth only if God is the truth. It stands or falls with faith in God. So this is something else that in your conversations with people when you hear somebody making some moral judgment, just ask them, what's your basis for making that judgment? As a Christian, I have a basis. What's your basis for saying something is right or something is wrong? So we have that. Another thing that we have as a result let me go back to this, is besides the division between God, the divine counsel, angels, man, and nature, those are everlasting distinctions. You know why that's important? Think about what we've got now with transgenderism. What is transgenderism? It's a blurring of the boundary between male and female. The Bible doesn't allow that. The Bible says these are created categories. So when God says to Adam, go name the animals, we use nouns. Nouns. Every language has a noun. Nouns classify things. That's what nouns do. And so how do you have nouns any longer, which you're seeing, total chaos in the language. Uh, look at some of the legislation. Nouns, male means male, and female means female. It doesn't mean something in between or some 32 different genders. But this is all a result of our creation, a result of Genesis 1. Finally, I want to take us to 
the concluding passage of scripture. Oops. Let's see here. Oh, wait a minute. Well, one, one incident here. I want to show the Declaration of Independence. We read the Declaration, but we forget that the men who wrote this knew very well the Bible. Uh, Dr. Luft, who had taught history for years and years at the University of Houston, for five years assigned every graduate student to read every document they could find of the Founding Fathers in all the world's libraries. Five years later, he concluded from over 10,000 different readings, what were the Founding Fathers quoting between 1780 and 1790? Do you know that 31% of the citations and source materials the Founding Fathers had were from directly the, the Bible? These people aren't stupid. They were smart and well-read. And so in the Declaration, notice the connection with Genesis 1. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Created, not evolved, created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Why are they unalienable? Because God has given it to them. If the government gives us rights, the government can take back those rights. But God has given unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, quoting Locke. So there's the declaration, there's this obvious case of, of uh, borrowing from the Bible. Now I want to end with, with this uh, passage from Romans. Well, I got w one more passage. But Romans 1, 19 and 20, that we're quite familiar with because we've read Romans, notice what it says here. What can be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, aortus in the Greek, are clearly seen, kata auroro. I mention that because when you put a kata, K-A-T-A, in front of a Greek uh, a verb, it intensifies the meaning. So for the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Paul is emphasizing, clearly seen, being understood from the things that are made, even as eternal power and divine nature, so they are without excuse. The point here is that the Bible tells us that we all deep down have a sense of deity. That goes for people maybe in your family that you've witnessed to for decades. We've had a person in our family, Carol and I have prayed for 30, 40 years, more, maybe 60 years, uh, and just, I have an impenetrable barrier. Well, you may have an impenetrable barrier and God can penetrate the barrier. But we know that in spite of what you say, you know, you have a sense of God. In fact, this is why you, you have an impenetrable barrier. You're trying to protect from that gnawing sense that I know I'm responsible to God. And one of the, one of the things that's come out of this recently in Acts and Facts, which is the publication of the ICR, uh, Randy Galuso, who's the head of it now, he makes an amazing statement. He says, if you look at this verb, clearly seen, being understood from the things that are made, that word is used only one other time in all the Bible. And you know where the other time that that expression is used, things that are made? It's in Ephesians 2, and it's talking about and translated workmanship. And what Dr. Buzo is saying is, that's the clue that we have when we look out at creation as in the hymn, um, we sang this morning, we look because we intuitively recognize that we are crafted. We know craftsmanship, and when you have that idea, it makes science exciting. We used to, the, the roaring thunder in that first stanza of the hymn, I hear the rolling thunder. When I was at Aberdeen, we were trying to figure out how, how, what power is in a lightning thing. Lightning and ammunition don't go too well together. So we want to be safe, and we use it. When a lightning bolt strikes from a cloud to ground or from cloud to ground, 
that's between four and five million volts. The amperage, for those of you who are electricians, the amperage of a lightning bolt is between 25 and 30,000 amps. So that gives you some idea of the power, if you could just capture that for power. But, and it goes through, the, the, the song, the hymn that we sang, talked about when I hear the whistling birds in the trees. Think of the birds. Have we mastered how a bird navigates? There's one bird that comes here to Bel Air, and he's been coming here for 10 years at the place where they do banding, and they call him the moon bird. You know why they call this little bird a moon bird? Because he has a thing on his, on his leg, so they, they identify the guy. He flies uh, something like 50,000 miles or something uh, from northern south hemisphere. How does he understand what, how much fuel he needs? How does he navigate? <laughs> Don't know. And they call him the moon bird because they figure out over 10 years that birdie has flown 250,000 miles. That's the distance from the earth to the moon. So they call him the moon bird. We don't know. There's mysteries all around us. So anyway, I want to conclude with a promise that we all use and show it. First Peter uh, 5, set 5 and 7. We like to quote, um, casting all our care upon him. It's a wonderful, precious promise that we use in our Christian life. But a, a Greek friend of mine, a Greek scholar friend of mine said, you better watch the sentence. Casting all your care upon him as a participial clause, and participial clauses are amplifying the main verb. The main verb in that sentence is not casting all your care. The main verb is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That's our creator. How does a creature respond to the creator? We humble ourselves. And how do we do that? We show it by casting all our care upon him. So that's a fortification of that precious promise that uh, God has given us. So I hope this has been encouraging to you that the Bible is to be believed, is to be used in life, it has answers to all kinds of things. We don't have to revert to bait and switch. We don't have to go into this area, these areas. We want to study them and come up with scripturally coherent understandings. But God is God, and he has revealed it to us. So, Father, we thank you for our time together, and we ask that your Holy Spirit encourage our life together with your word that we will cast our care upon you because you really do care for us as our creator. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, amen.